listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. All Hit Radio. To the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell. We're coming to you live and around the world from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to send us an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all, um, all social media networks, Exxon Radio TV. And you can listen to the Exxon, 724-365, as well as the show Monday through Friday from 8 p.m. until midnight at www.exxonradiotv.com. My guest this hour is a gentleman that I've had the pleasure of meeting in person. I've also had the pleasure of of having him on our show and other shows where I've been asked to uh, sit in and uh, bring credible people to the microphones of other radio talk show hosts. My guest this hour is Charles James Hull, and uh, he was born and raised in rural Wisconsin, uh, near Madison, Charles enlisted in the United States Air Force in July of uh, 1964. He was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base outside of Las Vegas, Nevada, for over two years. While there, he served for extensive periods of time as a weather observer in the desert of the Gunnery Ranges at Indian Springs, Nevada. Now, following this, he served a year in Vietnam in the Mekong Delta, Charles received an award for surviving more than 35 communist attacks. 
A year after receiving an honorable discharge in May of 1968, Charles married his wife and good friend Marie on the condition that he would go to college. In record time, he earned both a bachelor's degree in thermal physics and a master's degree in applied nuclear physics at San Diego State University in San Diego, California. Charles did Ph.D.-level postgraduate work at the University of Maine at Bangor. Later, he earned a master's in business administration from Nova Southwestern University at Fort Lauderdale in Florida. Now, I have set the stage telling you, the members of the Exo Nation, that Charles Hall is a very credible, hardworking, dedicated man. His wife, Marie, um, is his best friend. She is his con, you know, she is his rock, so to speak, just like my wife is mine. Marie is going to be joining me now to tell you what we're going to be talking about this hour here in the Exo so without further ado, Marie, welcome to the show. Great talking to you again. And Well, thank you, Rob. Um, Charles is a bit of a character, and so I always say I'm his character reference. Um, Charles is a pretty smart man. Uh, he got a, a perfect score on the graduate record exam in math. But uh, I don't send him shopping for a dozen eggs because he would come back with 11 and two of those would be cracked. So maybe that gives you an idea of what kind of animal he is. Um, Charles was very smart in that he waited until we'd been married a couple months to tell me about the extraterrestrials coming into his barracks at night when he was in the service. And he said, what do you think? And I said, well, I never thought about whether extraterrestrials exist or not, and I really don't care. I just hope that if I ever met one, I would behave in a manner that was a credit to the human race. And thinking about that, you know, in, well, 10 years ago or so, when I found he'd been working on his memoirs for over 18 years and hadn't told me about it, uh, that was what helped me come up with the title, Millennial Hospitality, because uh, we are going to have to be better Mm -hmm. humans when we have to deal with these people on a daily basis. Um, So... Let me tell you a little bit about the time I discovered he'd been uh, writing his memoirs. All right, why don't we do this, Marie? I've got to take a short commercial break. When we oh, come really? back, let's... Yeah, really. They pay the bills. So when we come back, more of this fascinating story. Charles James Hall is my special guest, as well as his beautiful wife, Marie. We'll be back here in the x on the other side of the short break. Don't go away. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Well, 
While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Wilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Wilda Wiaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Star began to demonstrate a metaphysical connection to the spirit world as a little girl. Her family noticed the connection, but it was a great-grandmother who told the family that Linnea was indeed gifted. The great-grandmother, who was also gifted, felt that Linnea had indeed inherited these attributes. It has been noticed that oftentimes, such things are passed down through the generations. Linnea was also born with a call, a thin white membrane across a newborn's face. Legend has it that if the baby is born with this call, the child will have second sight, or what we call psychic abilities. Linnea Starr does past, present, and future, and has the gift of prophecy. It is written within scriptures that if you are able to give factual information, and prophecies indeed come true, the gift indeed comes from the divine realm. Linnea Starr does large interactive groups as well as private gatherings. For more information on Linnea Star or to contact Linnea for a one-on-one consultation, visit her website at www.linneastar.com. That's www.l-i-n-n-e-a-s-t-a-r.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Welcome back, everyone. The story you are going to hear over the next 40 some odd minutes is true. We're not talking about some person making weird claims. We're not talking about a couple of guys in the back of a truck, you know, having some good old Jack. We're talking about a very credible man, a man that I believe, a man that I have met, a man that I have interviewed over the years. And um, his name is Charles Hall. His wife, Marie, is with us as well. And Marie, uh, if you could please continue the story. Uh, Well, uh, 10 years, well, when Charles was 58, he'd come to the end of a contract. And, uh, well, you know, if you're 58, you might have a lot of good interviews, but sometimes they end up hiring the person who's 48 or 38. And uh, this unemployment period actually lasted 18 months and I really think it was a gift from God because uh, a month into this period of unemployment I walked into the computer room and Charles shut the screen really fast and I said what are you doing and he said I'm working on a book and I said I haven't been able to get you to write three sentences to your mother I have to see this 
So he printed out two chapters of his memoirs. This was on an old dot matrix uh, print machine. And uh, I went into the other room and I read for about 20 minutes and I came back and I said, we have to publish this. And he said, oh no, I was just writing my memoirs for our grandchildren. And, uh, you know, even if you don't say anything bad about somebody, they can sue you. And I said, so just use the author's standard technique of uh, putting a disclaimer in the front of the book and uh, disguising the names of places and people and uh, pretending it's fiction. And he said, well, he, he really wasn't interested. He said, you know, the... Air Force never told me I couldn't talk about these things, but mm. on the other hand, they haven't been uh, forthcoming during the last 40 plus years. And I said, well, you know, disguise the place names too. Well, he still was not at all interested in doing this. And finally, I was so exasperated. I said, honey, if the men in black come to the front door, you should go with them. It's free room and board. <laughs> And he's, he started laughing, and he said, you're right, what do we have to lose? Well, a lot of these files that he'd written over the previous 18 years were on a dead, but not yet given a Christian burial, a Tandy 2000 that was out in the garage. So it was a lot of work to coax these files up, and then I had to do a lot of editing. Mm -hmm. I took out all the profanity because I wanted sixth graders <laughs> to be able to read it. Mm -hmm. And I took out the uh, vernacular, you know, that he worked with uh, fellows from the Bronx and mm -hmm. blacks from the South, and he was trying to imitate the way they talked. And I said, honey, I think these books will, or the, the book, I right. really didn't know there would be more than one book. I said, this book should be read by people all over the world for whom English might be a second language. So I want it to be in good English. Anyway, um, when I showed it to my uh, friend, who actually is an author, she said, um, oh, he should write more. This is good stuff, although it isn't really my cup of tea. And I said, well, he can't because... He had to swear to me that everything was true. I said, I don't have anything against science fiction or fantasy, but uh, I was going to have to pay uh, some of my modest uh, inheritance to, to get it published. And when I told Charles, he said, oh, well, I have more files on my computer and I have more stories that I haven't written down. And I said, really? And he said, well, yes, I was with them for over two years. But anyway, um, that, was, that was then, and uh, I would say that our popularity has uh, grown steadily. Uh, I note um, Edgar Mitchell said that we are going to have to make friends with these people the way we make friends with the neighbor next door. And I think that's the message in Millennial Hospitality Series. Charles doesn't try to prove the existence of aliens because, let's face it, you couldn't write a book proving the existence of God unless you had an audience that was open to the concept. I hate to say it, but that book's already been written. Yeah, but he, he just <laughs> walks you through uh -huh. what it was like for him as a young man, really fresh off the farm, and uh, anyway, I, we've had some amazing things happen to us over the years. Um, I'll just mention one short story and then uh, we'll put Charles on because I know this isn't a real long interview. Um, a few years back, a gentleman who had worked for NASA for a number of years and was very successful said that he always believed everything in Charles' books because mm -hmm. when he was at NASA, they asked him if he would like to transfer into the real space program and for that he'd have to move to Las Vegas and his uh, wife and daughter didn't want to leave their extended family so he left NASA started a business on his own and uh, still has a top secret clearance and 
Anyway, he wanted to uh, have us come and have dinner with his family and friends, which we agreed to. It took a couple months to set it up. And when we got there, he was so excited because he had been on many uh, bases, but he had never been to Indian Springs, which, by the way, is now Creech since 2005, July, I believe. But he was there for a ribbon cutting ceremony at the end of uh, some work that he had done. And he said there were no uh, lower uh, ranking military. It was all, you know, generals or uh, high ranking officers. And he was standing next to a general that he actually knew quite well, a friend of his. And he said, um, I was just wondering if I could drive up the road, you know, just a mile or two, I won't get out of the car and just look at the uh, scenery. And the general said, bad idea. You probably wouldn't come back alive. And then just that quickly, he said, I'm so glad you could make it for this event. You know, like, don't repeat what I just said. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he he said the atmosphere there was a very strange, much more secure than so many other places that he'd been. And he said he thought uh, Charles had really underplayed the strangeness and the security uh, of, of the place that he served in. But anyway, unless you have some questions for me, I think I'll just turn this over to Charles. All right. Yeah, that would be great. And and once again, to Marie. Great talking to you, and uh, well, thanks. Thanks. I wanted to keep it short because I know uh, you'll have a lot of qu- and ask Charles any questions you want. Any, if he any, doesn't know the answer, he'll say so. And if it's something he can't talk about, you know, like what mm-hmm. he's currently doing, um, he'll just say, "I can't talk about that." <laughs> I okay. understand, and okay. I appreciate and respect that. Let's put him on. All right. By the way, Exo Nation, if you'd like more information about Charles Hull and Murray, their website is millennialhospitality.com. And Charles, are you there? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. So how are you doing, Charles? Long time no talk. Oh, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Awesome. And I really appreciate you having me on your show. I hope that the microphone is picking it up correctly. Yeah, everything is fine over here, Charles. Um, Charles, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about what we're going to be talking about on the other side of the news? Um, Yes. I have personally stood in front of three different types of extraterrestrials. The ones I call the tall whites at Indian Springs, the ones I call the grays, which are in the secure areas up further north, and the ones I call the Norwegians with 24 teeth. And I have, I have a theory that I have copyrighted. My belief is that Einstein was wrong about relativity, that time does not slow down when you accelerate towards the speed of light. Mm-hmm. Dimensions do not get shorter. And what happens is the um, as you travel faster, turbulence develops in various other force fields. There's more force fields than what I know about. Wow. Now, uh, you are known and highly respected for the the information that you have brought to the world about the talls in Area 52. What I'd like to do, Charles, is after the news break, talk to you about Area 52 and your own personal experiences, if you can. Yes. All right, Charles, thank you so much. We're going to be taking our news break now. And Exxon Nation, don't forget, if you'd like to watch past issues of the Exxon TV show, we have all 12 episodes from... Uh, last year, my gosh, it's been a year already, at www.xzonetv.com. That's www.xzonetv.com. Charles Hall and I will be back on the other side of this news break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Uh, if you'd like to send an email to us, it's very simple. 
All you have to do is send your emails to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. And you can listen to the Exxon 724-365 at www.xzoneradiotv.com. Dot com. The Exxon is a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And uh, we're coming to you right here from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Charles Hall is my guest. We'll both be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Thomas Jefferson was a Burgess of 27 when he met Martha Whale Skelton, a 22-year-old widowed heiress who was fondly called Patty by her family. They were married on January the 1st, 1772, and they took up residence in a cabin on the building site on top of a Virginia mountain that Thomas had named Monticello. As Thomas and Patty slowly built their first version of the great house at Monticello, the Revolutionary War was heating up. Patty, with difficulty, bore five children, but only two girls survived. Thomas's political career developed to the point where he was often away from home, but after he authored and signed the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, he resolved never again to leave his wife. He was elected the governor of Virginia, just as that state became the revolution's last battleground. The Revolutionary War ended in 1781, and Thomas gladly retired altogether to my family, my farm, and my books. But Patty continued to want to bear her treasured husband a son, and late in the summer of 1782, she died of kidney failure at the age of 33, four months after having borne yet another girl. Thomas was so devastated by her death that he never remarried. He mourned her for the rest of his life, even as he helped to frame the peace in France and then became the first Secretary of State, the second Vice President, and the third President of the United States. This story is true. Thomas Jefferson was such an obsessive letter writer and record keeper that we know where he was and what he was doing nearly every day of his adult life. Every significant thing he says in My Thomas comes from his contemporary writings. My Thomas by Roberta Grimes is now available at Barnes & Noble, Costco, Target, Books A Million, Hudson Booksellers, Kmart, Walmart, Sam's Club, Walgreens, CVS, and online at Amazon.com. You can visit Roberta Grimes online at www.robertagrimes.com. <laughs> The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. 
We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Unwilling to be the government's deadly assassin, gifted psychic Kahara Mitchell went AWOL and ended up buried under rubble in the wake of a great tsunami. She regained consciousness far from Earth on the medical ship of a Dagaronian intergalactic fleet. Has she been rescued or abducted by aliens? The Chalice of Carrie, Kahira O'Donnell's latest paranormal science fiction romance, is the passionate story of an Earth woman and her destined mates, twin kings from another galaxy. Kahara uses her gifts fighting alongside Lords Rom and Ra in a war that will determine the destiny of galaxies. The Chalice of Kari by Kahira O'Donnell is now available at kahiraodonnell.com or at amazon.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genex provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Annie Callahan dedicated to negotiating a position for Earth within the Dagaronian coalition, had trained for three years to become an Earth ambassador. Yet, the very eve of her arrival at the capital ruling planet, she is claimed as destined mate to an oversized, mating maddened vamp who swears he will never release her. Lord Astaran, king of the Macian sector, has waited over 900 years for his destined mate, Having found her as an alpha vamp, he is unable to relinquish Annie, virtually holding her hostage until he can claim her. Yet Macians cannot survive without their mate's love. How could he strip her of her citizenship, her ambassadorship, and her freedom and expect to win her heart? With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is the latest book in this exciting series, The Dagaronian Chronicles, guaranteed to keep readers coming back for more. With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is available on Amazon.com and KahiraO'Donnell.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. And welcome back, everyone. Charles Hall is my special guest at this hour. His website is www.millennialhospitality.com. And uh, I love what it says beneath his website, dedicated to the greater honor and the glory of God who created all extraterrestrials included. Charles, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, So if you could tell our listeners 
your story about what happened and what you saw in Area 52. Um, <clears throat> yes. Um, in 1965, when you were uh, Indian Springs uh, Auxiliary Field was the most desolate field you could imagine. And when you looked up, when you looked up the valley from a Indian Springs to those mountains that are like 42 miles up there, mm -hmm. you, the upper half of that valley was inside the perimeter of Area 51. And if you looked straight to the north and to the east, then you were looking at where the main hangar was, the alien hangar. That was Area 54. And if you looked straight up the valley to the west, that was Area 53. That was their underground living area. And if you went up that valley, as I did on a number of occasions, you would find that to the east at Dogbone Valley, the deep spacecraft would land and take off on schedule the way airplanes do at an airport. And if you went straight up that valley and you went to the right, you would go up the mountains to the hangar, which I have been. On the other hand, if you went up that valley to the left, to Area 53, you would, you would go north, northwest, to Area 52, mm -hmm. to the S-4 facility, and the road would continue on to uh, 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 Area 51. My, I was a weather observer, and my clearance allowed me to go anywhere I wanted, day or night, no questions asked. And when you, when you went up the road towards Area 51, when you went straight up the valley and to the left, just before the S-4 facility, there was an intersection where the road continued straight towards Area Groom Lake and Area 50, Groom Lake in the distance. Mm -hmm. And if you turned left, then it would go down to a dry lake bed that is Area 52. And, um, and of course, my clearance said I could do anything I wanted, but I had to be alone. I could never take anyone with me, and I never did. Mm -hmm. If I had taken anyone with me, I wouldn't have been in any trouble, but the person with me might not have come back alive. And, um, and, and during the time, my five books describe um, some of the events that happened in those two years. There are some events that are not in the books. And uh, uh, because I was, I was trying to capture how it felt to live those days day by day. And I wasn't trying to give an overview. I was not trying to write a documentary. Mm -hmm. I was not trying to run, write an expose. I was trying to answer, I was trying to answer the question Come with me and count the hours as I live the longest day. And, you know, how did it feel to be up there coming down in Area 52 and realizing that the caves were above the highest water line and therefore had to have been built before, during the last ice age, that the Greys had to have been here since the last ice age? Yeah. Now, People are probably saying, Area 52, isn't it Area 51? Area 51 is just the cover area. Inside Area 51 in 1965, there were other areas that went up to Area 60. And then the areas were, were grouped into lands. So, for example, Area 53 and Area 54 and the northern half of Indian Springs Valley was dreamland. All area, uh, at area at area 51 per se there was just Groom Lake and uh, and area 52 was Papoose Lake Papoose Lake was so ungodly secret that when I was right my, oh, 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 oh oh my, my <laughs> sorry are you okay uh, it's so ungodly secret that um, I I was real that I I had to be real careful about what I talked about there. Mm -hmm. What did you see? Like, what you saw, did it, did it shake your, your very belief in, in the world around you? The tall whites, the grays, and the Norwegians come in family groups, men, women, and children. And the first thing it convinced me of is that there's a God and God is love. 
the biggest shock I ever had was realizing that Einstein was wrong about relativity. Right. There, the way I, the the gray, the tall whites and the grays, and the uh, Norwegians never came to teach me anything. I had to learn it all by reason, by just watching them and reasoning through it myself. And and so one night, one night I was certain in 1965. In late 1965, originally, I, I, it took me at least six months to get over the terror mm-hmm. of being out there alone around them, even though they were friendly. And, I, and I, in my books, I also describe times when I felt I could communicate with my guardian angels. And one of the, I'm Roman Catholic, and one of the points I'm trying to make in the book is the difference between talking to an extraterrestrial and talking to your guardian angel. There was absolutely no fear in talking to my guardian angels. They're pure love. On the other hand, the extraterrestrials, it takes you a while to get over your fear, you know, because they come armed and they're different than us. But um, th- th- that's another point I'm trying to make in my book. Is it possible, Charles, that the extraterrestrials of today were the, the guardian angels of yesteryear? No, because... No. Because once, as in, in that, for example, in book one, when I describe bringing those two airliners in, mm-hmm. in the storm, where my guardian angels came and showed me how the path would, the, the, the guardian angels are pure love, and you're, there's no fear whatever with them. And on the other hand, the extraterrestrials, you know, when you first come across them, are, are really terrifying. Now, it's possible that people in the Old Testament might have seen the tall whites and misconfused them because they might not have understood what it's like to talk to your guardian angel. Right. Once you understand what it's like to communicate with your guardian angel, you'd never confuse them. I understand that that there were different different species that that came to Area 52. Um, Would you say that... Area 52 was like a galactic bus terminal? No. Area 52 is run by the Greys, and 90% of the UFOs that you see Mm -hmm. are something to do with the Grey aliens. And the Grey aliens are very arrogant and very protective. And see, if there were any extraterrestrials that were considered to be... uh, threat to the gray alien children the gray generals would simply shoot them off no no quite no must no fuss there is no intergalactic council there's the grays there's the whites and there's the norwegians with 2014 why do you think charles with everything that you've seen and the people that i've talked to over the years the people that you've spoken to over the years and the people that you've met why do you think the government still has this truth embargo in place? Because there are so many humans that cannot handle the truth. There, when we, most of my fans are beautiful people who want to talk with me. But every now and then, you come across one or two fans mm-hmm. that really cannot handle the truth and really don't know how to reason their way through. In my books, one of the things I'm trying very hard to do is I was in some very difficult times, many times back in the 60s, and I re- and with God's help, we had to reason our way through it. God and And many people can't do that. Many humans can't. And so, you know, the, the, I, it doesn't surprise me that the government is extremely reluctant about saying that they're here. However, as the privatization of space, as NASA goes into space, they'll have to admit that they're here. But NASA's already been in space. We've been to the moon. We've sent uh, robotic craft to Mars. You know, we've gone past Pluto. So what what are the ETs waiting for? Why don't they just land and say, da-da, we're here? The ETs would. It's the government that won't. When I was, one of the episodes that is not in any of my books was in 1965, 
I was, you know, in my book, in book five, I talk about two mm -hmm. climate studies. Well, really, there were more than two. I just had to be very careful. In 1965, there was one of the first climate studies different than the two that are described in book five. And they sent, they sent me to those valleys north of Indian Springs. And I mean, and, and, and they were doing night missions. And the X, they had a two man, they had a two man version of the X-15 that you could live in, and they were circumnavigating the moon. Wow. And when, but they, there was no briefing. They just sent me out there. They told there was a weather, there was a weather station, uh, generator shack, supplies, and so on. But you could only go out. They, anyone but me, could only go out there for the last two weeks of Christmas, of December. And, and they told me to leave all the lights on, park the truck, it was so, you know, facing to the southwest, so, southeast, and to the southeast, and and then to take then to take my theodolite, my balloons, three or five miles out to the east, and release four balloons, one at ten, one at midnight, one at two, and one at four. Now the desert is really tough on weather balloons and. I'd broken a couple, and right. so I had the 10 o'clock run and the midnight run. And as I was doing the midnight run, and I was looking up, it was like 12.30 at night, and it was a beautiful night. The weather was fine. I could see the plane coming back in from the from the moon. It was doing almost 25,000 miles an hour, and it was heading for the runways either at Groom Lake or the runways over in Utah where they have more areas. And I remember feeling like I was such an like I was such a failure because I was supposed to have four wind measurements. I only had two, and I only had two stripes. And when I got back to the weather shack in the morning, the and and when I was out in the desert, there were people walking around my weather shack, extraterrestrials. They were the grays. And in the distance, in the um, you know the haze and stuff, I, I was confused as to what they were because they didn't look like humans. It looked like the maybe the colonels or something were checking up on me. And then when I went back in the morning and I called Nellis, the, um, they said I was supposed to bring my stuff in. Mm. And they weren't angry with me. They were just very nice. And so I put my stuff in the truck and my, I had, and they had said I should take everything I had in my, in my um, um, duffel bag. And I went into Nellis and there was a, sar I only had two stripes and there was a sergeant there. He was in charge, or a, Lieutenant there, he was in charge of my OJT, Lieutenant, and and I, God, I rec, I, I I idolized him. You know, he was six two. He had a car. He was, um, and I remember I was trying to explain to him that I was probably going to get an Article 15 or something, because the major had wanted to see me. And I remember he was saying, "Oh, I think they like you because when the major came back, he seemed happy." And then when then when four o'clock came, or I went out and the major called me in. And he was just very, he, he wasn't angry or anything. He was just very authoritative, the way, or the way a major is. And he said, the Pentagon generals really like what you're doing, and they're awarding you a big award. The award is, Monday I can take off, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not an act of Congress. It's not a vote of Congress. It's, you know, instead of reporting for duty on Monday, I can stay over the weekend and here at Nellis and just have fun on Monday and then go back on Tuesday. And that was one of the best awards I ever had. You know, I mean, it kind of shows what it was like. I was, I was, de I was desperate. I, I, I thought he was going to give me an Article 15 for missing the last two runs, and for him to say, "Well, take the Monday off, use the Air Force truck, and just go enjoy Las Vegas. The Pentagon wants you to." And and it's not in my records or anything, but I always counted that as one of the best awards I ever received. And I get to just wander around Monday and, wow. and use the government truck and have fun. And so that's the kind of stuff I'm trying to capture. That's the kind of stuff I'm trying to capture in my books is what it was like to be out there looking at the gray extraterrestrials some three or four miles away and then looking up at the airplane, the two engine, ver the double man version of the X-15, way high up coming back from circumnavigating the moon. And, and uh, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. Fascinating, Charles. Um, I, I, you, uh, in, in a previous interview, you said that 
At one time, you even took the extraterrestrials into Las Vegas. I didn't take them in. I had a joke about me taking them in. I see. The government would take them in. Their guards would take them in. I myself would be in Las Vegas and encounter them. So if if they look like us, if they can pass for somebody in Las Vegas, I, I, do we really need to fear them? Do we really need to suppress the information? Do we really need to make so many credible people look like morons? Um, if credible people would just do unto others, just through the golden rule, mm -hmm. you wouldn't need to. Now, there's three different kinds. The Norwegians with 24 teeth. The, oh, if you're not a dentist, you can't tell the difference between them and a human. Wow. Tell them about and the woman you worked with. I, I, one of, one, uh, well, there was a time that I worked with a woman, and, uh, and, and the, Norwegians, the Norwegians with 24 teeth, mm -hmm. they, they, um, they have the quality, they look just like humans, but they don't fidget. And I remember sitting in staff meetings and she would just be sitting there and the all the other women would be fidgeting right and one day she and i thought maybe it was me you know one day she came to me and said that she and about 20 of her playmates had grown up in a city on the east coast and and their parents the parents of all the children had, thought, had to put them up for adoption when they were about five. All right, Charles, we're going to have to take a little break here. A bit of a cliffhanger for you, the Exo Nation. Charles Hall is my special guest. www.millennialhospitality.com My name's Rob McConnell. This is the Exo. Charles Hall and I will return on the other side of this short break. Don't go away. children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. If you enjoy reading a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love From Out of the Woodwork by William S. Peckham. Sean Kennedy, a Toronto contractor, buys derelict houses, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, a century house in ruins, and starts the renovation, the house fights back. He is visited by ghosts of owners past. His visions are triggered by touching an oak mantle, reading a faded letter, opening an old locket or opening a brand new casket in the basement. 
These visions will take you on a trip across southern Ontario from Niagara Falls to Toronto to Kingston. From Out of the Woodwork is now available in paperback and on your favorite electronic reader. To order your copy of From Out of the Woodwork, go to www.williamspeckham.com. That's www.williamspeckham.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network www.xzbn.net Exonation Charles Hall is our special guest www.millennialhospitality.com uh, First of all, Charles, thank you and Marie for coming on the show tonight. Always a great pleasure talking to you. Um, but what would you like to tell the Exo Nation tonight, Charles? Do they have anything to fear from the extraterrestrials? Or is the fear and the hype based on Hollywood and the unwillingness of the government to be honest with the people? Well, you you have to treat them in a good neighborly fashion. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you're in France, you have to treat the French, you know, do unto others. Sure. The, the the tall whites, the greys, the Norwegians, they're very proud of their ability to protect themselves, especially the whites and the greys. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it, you can't mess with them. You can't, you know. Well, the first agreement I had with them was that if I saw one, I would just stop and sing a little song and let them know I was here. And then they would c- approach me as close as they felt comfortable and if they got too close, then I would back away and they would stop. So the first thing we would do is to negotiate a distance that we could talk to each other. Sometimes that distance was kind of far away, like a quarter mile. Wow. And, you know, because they had electronic communication and mm-hmm. so on. But see, when you deal with them, they don't want to be touched by a human. They don't want a human pursuing them. They don't want a human running up and running on board their scout craft. They want, them to be, they want humans to behave. As good neighbors. <coughs> so, so what what is your final message to the Exxon Nation tonight? Well, um, the t- the tall white mothers and the gray mothers mm-hmm. and the Norwegian mothers loved their children more than human mothers loved their children. Wow. The, I- the, I- the idea that a tall white mother would ever have an abortion or, mm-hmm. you know, sacrifice your child is just out of the question. Every mother, every mother I ever saw and father was proud of their willingness to die for their children, hands down. And so when you're around them, the first thing you have to do is to recognize that you, well, like when I'd start the conversation with them, I'd say, I'd say, I understand you love your children more than human mothers love their children. And and because that's what they said because to that's you. that's what they were proud of, mm-hmm. you know. They thought of us as barbarians because of all the things that we were willing to do to our kids that they would never dream of. So, what was their purpose in, in coming here? The purpose is the same as the reason there's a air there's an airport on on Honolulu in on Oahu and on the Hawaiian Islands. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a place for craft to stop, refurbish, repair. They'll be in port for two weeks and then they'll stand out to space again. It's a place to it's a place to service their deep spacecraft. Charles, I want to thank you and Marie so much for joining us. Always a great pleasure talking to you. Take care of yourself and have fun in Hawaii, guys. <laughs> thank you for having us. It's my pleasure. Exonation Charles Hall and his Beautiful wife, Marie, who has super hats, I might add, has been our guest this hour, www.millennialhospitality.com. That's www.millennialhospitality.com. Now, I'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exome from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't forget, you can check out the last season of the Exxon TV show at www.exxontv.com 
and the X-Zone store where you can buy all your X-Zone gear. www.thexzonestore.com Don't go away. I'll be right back. <laughs> 